Um, yes, I'm Tom, and I um, work at the Centre for Alternative Technology in Wales, which you might have heard of. I've got a couple of slides about that later on. I came from a background in ecology where I worked at the University of Liverpool for quite a lot of years, too many years in research and then teaching. And um, I've got the, the ordinary amount of publications and editorships and that sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to get cracking now. You can always ask if you want to know more. So the first thing I want to do is, is to outline the, the talk. So what is biodiversity? Um, are species of any practical use to us? And why do we need biodiversity? And what can ecosystems teach us about the world? And altogether, I think I hope we'll have answered that final question, what constitutes ecosystem health and why should we care? <clears throat> so let's get cracking. Biodiversity, what is it? So you might have your own ideas about what biodiversity is, um, but I thought I'd share this because a few years ago, the BBC did a survey. They went to 13 UK cities and they asked the public in the shopping high streets what they thought the term biodiversity meant. And the top answer, can you guess? So I bet some of you know this already, a washing powder. So a washing powder is what the public think or did think a few years ago was the um, meaning of the term biodiversity. So hopefully a lot of people out here will, will know a bit better than that. And I'm going to um, talk about it. Some people might have seen this picture as well. It's been banded about quite a lot since 2009 when it was produced by Johan Rockström at Stockholm. It's um, summarizing what they call the planetary boundaries for a Holocene, which is suitable for human life. So the Holocene is the period since the last ice age. And during that period, all of human civilization has developed. And the, one of the reasons for that is because the climate has been equable and, and conducive to developing civilizations in many parts of the world, at least. Um, and it's noted that the purpose of this picture is to look at what we're doing. Are we taking the earth out of balance? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so you can look at the um, biodiversity here on the on the bottom. Let's get a cursor so you can see that. That's biodiversity loss. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to have a drink. <clears throat> Too many frogs. Um, and the biodiversity loss now has been calculated to be lying at, for different species groups, between 100 times and 100,000 times the natural rate of extinctions. So... If you look at the, the red, I'm pointing at the screen, I should use this cursor, shouldn't I? Um, look at the red thing coming out here. It's way past the limit. And the limit is the edge of this green piece um, in the middle. That is what is considered safe, the safe operating space for humanity, as they call it. So the biodiversity loss is not there. Then we have climate change at the top there. That's way over the, the planetary boundary as well. We're at the, in this year, we've been recorded at 416 parts per million carbon dioxide. Pre-industrial levels were 280 parts per million. And what is regarded as safe is 350. So we need to get back down. We need to sequester some of the carbon that's in the atmosphere in order to um, re-enter the safe zone. And the other one that's um, far exceeded is use of nitrogen. So this is addition of nitrogen to the environment. So our, our, the Harbour Bosch process of, of um, creating nitrogen for industry and agriculture has actually overwhelmed the natural sources of, of nitrogen to the atmosphere. Well, I was thinking about how to describe um, an ecosystem to people who didn't know. This was a few, a little while ago, it was, it was economists I was talking to. And I thought, how can I do it? And I was working in the garden and I removed this bag of B&Q composted bark, which had been there for a while in, in a sort of litter building up area on this concrete. And underneath it, when I picked it up, were a dash for, for um, safety for, of lots of organisms. I went in and got a camera. And by the time I came back, all, all the fast moving ones had gone, of course. But you can see I took a picture of some worms there's a, a worm there and there's a little worm there and you can see the soil that's there and there's no soil on the on the open bits of stone 
a couple of slugs. And what ran off were um, the centipedes, particularly wood lice, sort of scuttled off a bit more slowly. And there were lots of other things there that I haven't included in the photograph, um, particularly nematodes. There were nematodes and other little crawly creatures I couldn't identify. There was also dust and bits of leaves and sticks that had blown in and got trapped underneath the, the bag. There was water and there was a, a plant of grass, one single grass plant that was stuck to the side of the bag and its roots had sort of penetrated underneath. So I thought, well, this is something I can build a picture of about how ecosystems work because there are ecosystem functions there. Removal of organic matter, that is taking those those uh, leaves and bits of stick and things that get blown in dust and converting those into other substances, nutrients and soil and things. Uh, nutrient cycling, the nutrients that were in those leaves are in organic form, they were taken out and, and converted to inorganic form. And I know that because if they hadn't been, the plant wouldn't grow because of the plants need the inorg inorganic form of nitrogen and phosphorus to, to grow. Then there was water retention, it was damp under there, and soil building. You can see in these photographs even little bits of soil, particularly here, that were building up. So I drew a, photo, a picture of it, and I called it a rudimentary ecosystem. And you can see these are the things I saw in it, the main things I saw in it. Um, you've got dark from the bag, you've got light coming in at the side of the bag that the grass is using, rainwater trickling down the side and inblown material there at the top. That's all those sticks and leaves and things I was telling you about. Underneath were, were the, the organisms. So the, the straight arrows, solid arrows, are things that use other things. For, so for example, bottom left, the centipede will eat earthworms. The fungi on the right will colonize the inblown material. So one of the functions of fungi is that an old leaf that's hard and, and tough will be colonized by the fungi and they break it down and make it palatable to other organisms like the woodlouse, for example. And then these things are, are processed. The bacteria colonize it, the, the wood lice and the worms eat that other material that's been, been um, what we call processed by the fungi and bacteria. They produce poo, frass, um, that contributes to the mud as well as the organic um, matter that's broken down, dust and so on. And that's how it works. And these things are processes of ecosystems. So on the right hand side of this slide, I've got um, a list of things of, that was there. And in red, so waste removal at the top, they are what, what we call ecosystem functions, nutrient cycling, soil formation. I went through them previously. So they, it's a, they, all these interactions are processes, they're things that organisms do naturally, and they lead to functions which are important for, for maintaining ecosystems. So if you multiply that up to um, something like this wet meadow here, you might find a lot of species there. So there, there were, I, I did a quick count and I found about 20 something species, but there were probably more of plants. Um, and they included wild carrot, and they could include all sorts of other things I put there at the top. And every one of those species of, 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 of um, organism there contains genetic variability, just like we do. We have different color eyes, different color ears, different color skin, different color hair. We're tall, we're short, we're, we have all different traits. All of those organisms have different traits as well. And the community is suited to different environments. So this was a wet meadow as I said but the, the organisms some of the species might have been in common but but um, in a drier environment there would be a different balance a different community of organisms some will tolerate drought more and some will tolerate wet more some will tolerate low pH acid conditions and some will will tolerate the more base conditions shade again mix of species and the influence of those and diseases they will have genetic variability to fight off diseases. It's an, it's an ongoing battle in organisms. Um, and of course, damage to the, the ecosystem itself will threaten those relationships and will threaten the genetic diversity. And it's the genetic diversity as much as the species which constitutes um, biodiversity. So how many species in total here? We counted the plants, but there are 
invertebrates and fungi and bacteria and all the rest of it, quite a lot. And how many species in total in a rainforest in, in um, Brazil, which this one is. If you can think of those things all based on that same sort of interactions that I found under that little yard <clears throat> um, bag, you can imagine how what there is. So there's a paper quite recently um, reckoning that there are about 6 million species on Earth. So not that long ago, it was thought to be 1 million, maybe. So they found these, and they found that most of them are bacteria. All these at the top are bacteria. And then there's archaea, which are similar to bacteria, they're prokaryotes. Um, and we are here, eukaryotes. So not just humans on that bit. We are accompanied by every animal and every plant, all al algae and fungi, they're all there. And all the rest, the other big thing uh, at the top there and to the side, are prokaryotes, they're bacteria and archaea. So we are evolutionarily offered a tangent. We've, we, but there was a it's thought to have been a chance occurrence where um, a, an organism engulfed another organism and didn't consume it. And it's, that was the beginning of um, multicellular life, mitochondria, chloroplasts, if you're interested in that sort of thing. So I want to just very briefly talk about what a niche is. So a niche is described as an n-dimensional hypervolume. So any species, and it lives within that blue blob in the middle there, it tolerates a certain range. So any of the variables that we talked about, light and shade, wetness, pH, salt concentration, it's too little, too much, too small, too great, it lives within the middle there. And that's its n-dimensional hypervolume where it can live, where it can live. Where it actually li lives is quite small. So that, if you think of that blue blob and convert it to, oh, it's who are, what limits plant choice, for example, on a single seashore? A shingle seashore, um, whether it has shells on it or not, uh, has a very particular environment, doesn't it? You can think of it being very desiccated, exposed to a lot of salt, wind, um, trampling, all sorts of things. It, the, the tolerances of the organisms that can survive there, you know, sea holly or, or something, have got to be quite particular. So now think about that blob, and there it is again, different shape, and in it is the what they call the realised niche, and the, the, that is the the habitat, the niche that the organism will actually survive in. And that's because of other things like competition. So it's not going to um, do so well where there's lots of competition for resources. Okay, so you can think about why, why those things might be, if you want to, it's all very interesting. What it adds up to is ecosystems, whether it's a, a, a woodland forest in North America, like that one, Canada in fact, or a rainforest or a coral reef, all these things add up to this very, very complex, intricate interactions between species where they're using resources and surviving from being eaten and poisoned and infected by parasites. And it's all based on this same idea of these little interactions that I've found under that, that um, little bag in my garden. So I hope that gives you an idea of how these things work. The, the, the main rule is line of least resistance. They always follow that path. Okay, are species of any practical use? You might recognise this if you went to Chester Zoo. Ecosystem services is the term. It was con coined a few decades ago. Um, and what I've said there is why isn't the world 200 miles deep in dinosaur poo? And that is some real dinosaur poop, fossilized, of course, um, and a plastic dinosaur. But that sums up what ecosystems are, really. Ecosystem services are. They are things that we find useful. Biodiversity, which we've discussed very briefly, briefly, leads to functional species groups. Now, they are groups of species that all do the same thing. So a lot of insects pollinate, for example, there'd be a functional species group, and they, they result in ecosystem functions, pollination, and they provide ecosystem services to us, which is we, they provide our crops and, and um, flowers and things like that. 
I've got this table here, which is just giving you an idea. So the functional group on the left there, water plants, they remove chemicals and take them into their tissues. They remove pathogens by um, sedimenting them out into the water column. And in doing so, they clean water and they assimilate wastes pr produced by society. Soil microbes, they recycle the nutrients. They take all sorts of, of um, materials, even pollutants, and they um, recycle them into useful things that other organisms can use. Um, so they increase fertility and they assimilate waste as well. Terrestrial plants, they grow primary production. They provide food and fodder and timber and all the rest of it. Arthropods, that's creepy crawlies, including insects. They prey on pests and they remove pathogens and they also pollinate as we discussed before. So ecosystem services are, is, is, it's a, a word that was created to describe what thing, what ecosystems do for us. Um, they help sustain human life. They're the source of all those materials we talked about. They enable soil formation. The soil wouldn't build up without them. It would just be some sort of regolith. Um, and they enable our crops to grow. They take up our wastes from homes and industry, and they contribute to regulation of, of the environment. So the regulation of climate, the regulation of floods and diseases and pests and all those things, um, they are regulated by ecosystems. And, the, the, and it's needed. The, the, the wastes that we, are, um, we produce and the resources that we consume constitute uh, uh, what, the, what is called an ecological footprint and just to give you a guide, and you've probably heard that World Wildlife Fund calculated that we need 3.2 Earths if we all lived like we do in Britain. Um, the ecological footprint of London is about the size of the UK. So, it's, so we need ecosystems in order to assimilate those wastes. And of course, they support these other things, what I call making life worth living. So there we go. Now, this is a picture that we produced to try to describe how biodiversity contributes to ecosystem functioning. Now, there are some people who have, who have said in the peer-reviewed literature and elsewhere that we only need a certain number of things. We can have honeybees for pollinating. We don't really need all the other, all the other species. Um, and this is just to really show that they're wrong. So these little blue discs here, they represent one species in its niche. And if you have the top, top row there, low diversity equals reduced function. If you don't have many species, much diversity of species, you don't get so many functions. You can derive that from what we've seen on those previous slides. So if you have more species, the middle line, you have increased diversity, and that leads to increased functional diversity, more diversity of functions able to be completed and that really uh, results in increased functioning. If you go to the bottom line, high diversity leads to what they call functional redundancy. That means you've already got some species there to complete those functions so you don't really need those others. There's no improvement in functioning with more species. That was thought to be the case by some people but more recent research has found that we need at least 80% of all species in, to, in order to, co to continue provision of those services and those ecosystem functionings. That's because a, a disease comes along and wipes out some, so you need to have a contingency. So functional redundancy is a bit of a misnomer, should be called contingency perhaps. An example of this um, need for wild species is, is um, provided nicely by some flooding in, in Bangladesh. Um, the weather changed a bit. The, the Himalayas was, were um, denuded of trees, the rivers silted up and flooding increased. Um, and flooding in the, in the wrong time of year for rice, it tended to um, make the rice grow up taller. So when water was inundating the areas, once rice was established, um, it made them grow tall. Then they sort of wobbled in the wind and they flew over fell over and the, the seeds rotted in the flood. And they found some, some uh, scientists working with a chap I used to work with, in fact, found some wild species of, of rice living in ditches 
They were just in areas that were on the edges of the fields and they noticed, um, a local um, scientist noticed that these particular species did not grow rapidly and fall over when, when it was flooded. So that by crossbreeding with them, they managed to come up with a cultivar that um, stopped growing. So when it flooded, it's just stopped growing. And then when the floods receded, it continued to grow and it didn't flop over. So that just the genetic resource and the variation in those wild species was then crossbred into the cultivated species and saved the crops. And it saved a lot of people's livelihoods as well. So how do we value nature? So here, here is a picture of um, some people having killed a tiger. Why does nature matter? So apart from the fact that it makes life worth living, as I, as I um, mentioned, we depend on it for our survival and our economies. These are the ecosystem services I've been talking about. And that's the things that humans find useful, that they benefit from just because the ecosystems exist and function. Now this picture I've included here because Prince Philip is one of those happy young blokes. There he is on the left hand end of the picture as we're looking at it. And he went over to India with a, with a sort of royal procession and the Maharaja wanted to take in tiger hunting. And he didn't like the idea. He gets a lot of stick, a lot of it deserved, of course, but in fact, he's not a, a hunter like that. He might have been one of his early days. He pretended to the Maharaja that he had a, a sore finger, and so he couldn't go on these elephants shooting tigers. But he did his dignitary stuff, and there's the dead tiger that someone else shot. When he got back to the UK, he was, in, he was interviewed by somebody on television, and he made a comment which I've remembered to this day, that the interviewer said to him, why does it actually matter, you know, if people shoot tigers, what good do they do? You know, does it matter if tigers go extinct? Um, and he said, he looked at him and he paused and he said, anyone capable of asking that question would be incapable of understanding the answer. And that stuck with me, that phrase, and I thought that really was a good thing to say. So he went up in my estimation a bit then, old Philip. And this is one of the reasons, it links to this graph here from Brian Moss's book, Liberation Ecology. And it is all the backgrounds from all the global leaders. So he counted them all up. Um, this was a bit a few years ago, 2011, I think he did it, published 2012. And he found that the leaders, whether they were dictators or monarchs or presidents or prime ministers or whatever, they came predominantly from these things here, economics, politics, law, business, and the lesser things of military and engineering. <clears throat> there was only one chap um, who was the president of the Maldives who had studied maritime studies in his, he did a degree at Liverpool John Moores University on um, maritime studies. And he was the only person who had any kind of environmental knowledge in all of the world leaders. Shortly afterwards, of course, he was overthrown in a coup. So you can take that little little red dot and put it up on the end of military um, because he was deposed. So that's what the, the, um, the balance is of world nature. So no wonder people don't have an understanding of the importance of ecology. They've never been taught it they've where well, they work in economics and politics and law and uh, they why should they understand it they have to be taught again <clears throat> uh, so here's a, a little illustration of that what politicians are doing and why so this starts um at a, at a survey in 1970 the living planet index and this is just the the vertebrates bit and they, they discovered that they called that 100, the population index of 117. They use that now as a, as a yardstick. So that's when the dark side of the moon came out a little while later for um, people of this, my age, um, major event. So if you look a bit further on, West End Girls from some pop group, I can't remember. And that is um, 1986. Um, that's when globalization started to kick in. It had started with 
in sort of late 70s, uh, 1980, with the sort of Thatcher Reagan type sort of nexus. And it had increased global production. And then Tony Blair came along and it was accelerated. And so the species, as you can see there, um, on the left hand axis, you can see the, the population index, the number of species, freshwater vertebrates are particularly badly hit. The black line is the mean number of species. So red are terrestrial, um, blue are marine, green are freshwater. So you can see it's sort of plummeting and it's doing so in a, in a negative correlation with globalization, in other words, global economic activity. And you can see it also, the effect of it in a graph like this over the same sort of period, 1965 to 2005 in this case. And these are terrestrial, on the left, terrestrial environments, ecosystems, marine ecosystems. And then on the right, they are coral reefs in, in the Caribbean and in the Indo-Pacific. And the dashed line is protected areas. So during that period, 1965 to 2005, the number of areas in kilometer, square kilometers of that were protected to, to um, help species and protect biodiversity increased. You can see it on all four of those, went up quite dramatically as people became aware that there was a problem. At the same time, the level of biodiversity in those same areas reduced drastically in all of them. So you can see that that happened. Now, of course, without the protected areas, the, the curve for the biodiversity might have been even steeper. But in fact, um, there was still a, a net loss of biodiversity in all ecosystem types during that period. Okay, so what's the lesson from that? The lesson is that cons conservation strategies are valuable. They do save species, they do save habitats, and groups like um, World Wildlife Fund and RSPB, they've moved from single um, you know, characteristic, what are they called, megafauna, um, they've moved to habitat scale and conservation. Um, because of that, they fail to protect nature that we need. And the root causes are land use change, we, wiping out wetlands, we're wiping out rainforests, and because we're consuming too much, we're hunting a lot. Hunting is much more important um, aspect than most people think. Invasive species are quite can be quite devastating. They come in and they wipe out other native species. And then, of course, climate change um, itself changes the environment and leads to greater erosion. For example, fossil fuel use you know, is all is all part of it. Of course, not not the whole story. In two thousand. Um, the United Nations decided to create this Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was published in 2005. And they looked at a lot of things. It's definitely worth reading the synthesis report. And um, one of them was the impact on biodiversity over the previous century. So you can have a look at these. So the colors, um, I can point at my screen with the, with the cursor. The colors here are pale um, light getting darker. That is the, the, the scale of the impact on the biodiversity. So the darker the colour, the more serious the impact on biodiversity of these different areas. So habitat change, climate change, invasive species, overexploitation, and pollution from nitrogen and phosphorus, also called eutrophication. And the arrows are the impacts. So whether the impact is decreasing, continuing unchanged, increasing or increasing very rapidly. And you can see there that they're all like that, except one, which is the temperate forest where the impact is actually decreasing. So we're creating more temperate forests. Of course, a lot of those are monocrop um, things, um, conifers. So not quite so, so biodiverse, but they do provide habitat and a lot of um, broadleaf things are growing as well. So we're not doing very well. We're, we're increasing the the eutrophication there of which is from agriculture nearly all of it um, is going up very rapidly climate change in every case is going up very rapidly as well and the others are having mixed effects habitat change this is some um, clearing of, of um, natural habitats of course so the united nations um, the environment program decided that they would write 
what they called a Stern-like review. So Nick Stern's review of climate change had just come out, and that had was it was commissioned by um, Gordon Brown, and he Nick Stern that is, um, he concluded that climate change was important after all. In fact, it was quite frightening. He worked out that it was about twenty times more cost-effective to mitigate the causes of climate change than it was would be to adapt to it. In fact, he revised that up. Up later, so they wanted that same sort of review for biodiversity, and they called it the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. Um, I was involved in the project when I was at Liverpool. And the aims of it were to better inform economic policy so that people understood the consequences of, the, of their of their activities, their economic activities, incorporate valuation of nature into policy and planning and economics and find ways to integrate ecology and economics. That's the sort of most difficult one, I think. And it was also designed to, to speak to the decision makers. It was, it was couched in their terms, terms like natural capital and um, things like that. And ecosystem services, in fact, were all part of this idea that you can get those people to understand um, the consequences, the economic consequences of their actions, because they are unaware of them. They don't recognise that creating new this, that and the other or flying on holiday is directly linked to loss of nature. Um, because nature is worth quite a bit. So quite an old study now, Bob Costanza and friends, um, did a rough calculation of the economic value of ecosystem services. And this doesn't exclude sort of human values as well, but it tries to put a price on them. It does that by asking people, how much would you pay to keep this woodland or whatever? And it's a, it's a very um, imprecise and rough measure of value of people's real values, but it has an attempt. But it did the, the, um, the, the calculations of the economic value of all the things that ecosystems provide for us, the ecosystem services. And it came out to about twice the value of global GDP just for the ecosystems being there. And it wasn't counted and they were classed as wasteland and built on and all the rest of it and ripped down to make soya. In the TIB project, we came up with them. Um, we, we reviewed quite a lot of uh, ecosystem services and I've put them on the left hand column of this graph so you can see them. I hope you can see my cursor there. Food, water provision, fuel and fibre, genes, pharmaceuticals, ornamentals, regulating ecosystem services, regulating things like air quality, noise, flooding, climate regulation, extremes, uh, extreme weather events, that is, erosion prevention, soil fertility, all these other things. This is when we looked at them and what they depended on and what they were derived from. So you can see they depended on production of these things, on wild relatives, on wild species, forests, wetlands, wild relatives, high biodiversity again there, vegetation, natural habitat, all the same sort of things. In, they were all derived from, in the third column, ecosystems, ecosystems, forest, grassland, marine, wild populations, wild habitat, they're all the same, diversity, pollinators. And the factors and threats at the end there, population growth, land use, habitat loss, habitat loss, pollution, habitat fragmentation, habitat loss. These are all economic related things. We're taking the habitat to grow farms, to grow palm oil, um, to, to um, get timber, um, to all the rest of it, to, to build infrastructure on. Um, and then climate change at the end, all of them have climate change as a factor and that is a threat to provision of those ecosystem services. So we're not really um, controlling these things. And we know this is, these are sort of pointers to what we've got to do to, to um, try and solve this. So if we come back to this Rockstrom graph again, you can see if you start at the top there, climate change, that's gone up. Ocean acidification, this is threatening the species in the ocean and the capacity to buffer carbon dioxide. Stratmospheric ozone depletion, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus down there, global freshwater use, change in land use, biodiversity, we covered that, uh, and then atmospheric aerosols and chemical pollution, they were not quantified at the time, 
<clears throat> it's, it's quite old now. There have been updates, but I've given you the original source. All these are environment related factors. They're all connected with, with biodiversity. So what can ecosystems teach us about the world? So this is a, sort of another section that um, I hope is not too heavy duty for you, but you can always go back to it. Ecosystems react to external influences. So an external driver, I've called it here, for example, temperature, but also nutrient concentration at the bottom there. So on the left hand side of that graph, the vertical axis, I've got species richness, in other words, the number of species in an ecosystem. As the nutrients go up, so you've got on the bottom left, low nutrients, there are not very many species. As the nutrients increase, more species are able to survive. And as the nutrients continue to increase, they fail again. Now, what is that? That's something quite interesting. So you can look at this through lakes, shallow lakes. They were one of the ways that this was worked out originally by Brian Moss and um, Martin Skeffer and Com company. Um, so I'm using nutrient concentrations because that is also a proxy for other environmental drivers, you know, salt, temperature, pH. Um, it was known in, in lakes. So the number of species on the left there, uh, what happens in a, a lake that's got very, very low nutrients is the plants are all small. Um, they're um, what they call isoated plants. They, they grow, they have their nutrients um, from the sediments. They have the roots in the sediments. And the water is very clear because there's not enough nutrients available to, for, to, for, for things to grow in the water. And the light therefore gets to the bottom and they can grow quite happily. As nutrient concentrations increase, then nutrients are available in the water column. So these larger plants grow up. They get their nutrients from the water as well as from the sediments. Or some of them just get them from the water only. And they can grow much bigger. So they take those nutrients and they store them in their tissues and they grow bigger. So here at the right hand end, when nutrient concentrations are high, you often get very few plants or even zero plants. You might get microscopic algae. The, si the system becomes unstable up this end as it gets more and more nutrients. So I'm going to a graph that looks more complicated than it is. I'm going to go through it um, step by step, so hopefully everyone will be able to follow it. If you're an electrician, you might recognise it anyway, because um, it's something that occurs in electronics. Um, it's called a hysteresis graph, which means, which means delay. So here we have two ecosystem states from the same ecosystem. So you can call this uh, a shallow lake. And it was actually a shallow lake in Cheshire that informed most of this work, particularly the one in, in Mir. Um, so here we've got state A and here we have state B. So state A is a clear water state with lots of plants in it, lots of organisms living on the plants, snails, water boatmen, fish, you name it, a lovely clear lake with water lilies or something. State B is a bit of a sort of pea soup. So it's just, there aren't any plants there, the, the water's column is shaded um, and, the, and the water is green from microscopic algae. So those two states can exist over the same conditions. But if you notice these vertical red dashed lines, one there and one there, at F1 and F2, that is the area between those two lines where both sets of conditions can exist in a lake at different times, of course. So a lake could convert from a nice clear water state A to um, a poor, murky, smelly, toxic state B and vice versa. So to the left of the left-hand dash line, at the top left, you have pristine conditions, clear water, lots of species, all the rest of it. And up the, in the bottom right, you have unique algal dominance. So the, the um, microscopic algae are dominant, no plants can grow. But between those lines, then either condition can go. So often in a lake that's receiving pollution, so conditions at the bottom there, um, nutrients we can use, 
increasing. So if it's receiving a lot of pollution from agricultural runoff or a golf course or something, it might flip from this nice state A to state B. So this state we like and this state we don't like, and they can swap between the two, uh, depending on outside conditions. Now we put in a dashed blue line and this is representing the expected change as conditions might increase. So if you can imagine instead of a lake that might flip, it was 20 pots of water and you, and the one on the extreme left is clean water. And on the next one to it, you add a quarter of a teaspoon full of dye and the one to the right of that one, half a teaspoon and the one to the right of that, three quarters of a teaspoon and so on until you get to the right hand side of the conditions where you've got a blue dye. So you would have a graduation, a gradation of clear water going up to sort of light blue, mid blue, dark blue, intense blue. And that was what, what you, you might expect as conditions increase going down that line. What actually happens, of course, is it stay, the system stays in state A and then suddenly flips to state B. And the reason it does that is because it has what we call stabilizing buffers. These are functions of the ecosystem that hold it in that state and it has a resilience to changing. Of course, there are an equal set of buffers in the bottom state, um, preventing it from going back to the clean state. So if you're trying to clean up this lake, you would have to go all the way with your conditions, all the way to this line here before it would spontaneously flip, unless you can do some clever tricks with it. Now, the, the buffers, what they are in the top, in the state A buffers are plants. They take up the nutrients. Um, as fast as they're added. Um, the plants contain organisms inside like zooplankton and they consume the microscopic algae, preventing their populations from growing up, that sort of thing. In the bottom one, in the bottom one, state B, the stabilizing buffers are density. So the light can't get down to the, to the roots, so plants can't start to grow. Um, the, there are, because there are no plants, zooplankton can't hide there from the fish and they get eaten, um, that sort of thing. So you, you can go on and on about it, but um, there are, there are um, simple versions. So they're feedbacks, they're negative feedbacks to stop the other, the other um, condition um, taking over and they can be managed by, by the environment. But as the conditions go on, getting more and more concentrated, it's more and more likely that it will go into the degraded state. Another way of looking at it, I'm not gonna spend time on this, this one, but a lot of people like to think of it as this sort of ball in cup model. You can see the previous graph at the bottom there relating to this one. So in the first state, the nearest ball in the um, left-hand side, it's nice and safely in its cup and it can't come out. As the conditions change, a new situation arises from the, um, switch my electricity on <laughs> before the battery runs out. Um, a new situation arises where it could survive in another another um, situation as it goes more, can you see, it gets deeper and, and then a slight perturbation to the system, a shot adding in a lake, for example, adding carp might push it into the degraded state. And there, when it's very high conditions, it can't get out of it. So moving it back is, is awkward. Okay, so these tipping points or regime shifts as they're called or alternative stable states are also called, they've been identified all over the place, the ice sheet, the um, Amazon rainforest and various other places. And they think that the more of those that switch, the more unstable will be the homeostasis of the planet um, as, as in those planetary boundaries. An example is the Amazon drought. So this is getting old now as well, 2005. Soil water, this is, so this is plant available water, very dry, very dry, slightly wet, blue is wet. So the Amazon is drying out from the east. And since 2005, when this was, this was made, 
that has, is actually occurring more and more. And what you get is fires, and that's what the fires will do to a tropical rainforest that's supposed to be wet. And that's what it used to look like, as I showed you before. Um, so it can be quite devastating, and the more it happens, the more likely it is to happen. It's not just um, consequences for species that live there, with the um, uh, fish kills, for example, from drought and from botulism. They are devastating for local people who depend on them. Now, this is a, a, a model from the Hadley Centre that was um, about 10 years old now. So the government have had this for 10 years. There's a few of these. This is rain and snow over the 100 years of data that were, since um, scientific instruments were able to collect it reliably in 1865, I think it was. Um, and it goes up. So they take those data and they um, model them and they create these. And you can see this where it's 1935, 1945, 1950. It's wild variation. Gradually, as it gets towards the end of the century, 2005, things start to change. They take those data, they project them forward for another 100, 100 years, 2075, 2085. I'll run it through one more time, and I want you to have a look at South America, since we've been talking that, about that. So it's 1915, normal variability that, are, that are just occurs between years. 1975, you can see it starts getting red here. The red is drought. And blue is wet to 2045 2055 all of the amazon so you can see that it's serious and it's changing the planet the homeostasis of the planet the the species that live on it and the things that we um depend on that come from ecosystem services yeah so let's go see about what we can do about it so um, Pushpam Kura and, and friends came up with um, a list of ecosystems um, services or, that regulate the environment. So they regulate here on the left hand column, air quality, climate, water quantity, erosion, water purification, waste treatment, soil quality, disease, pests, pollination, natural hazards. And these control, they, they regulate these, these things on the left-hand column by using the control of the things on the right-hand column. So ecosystems regulate air quality by collecting pollutants and dust. They control pollutants and dust by creating still areas, by attaching them to their leaves um, and all the others. So we've got their erosion, so they control the loss of soil structure and they, and they build soil. So water purification, they control nutrients, they control pathogens, particulates, pests, all of these things. Um, that's how they control it. That's what they came up with in that um, publication. So I've taken that, and those are the, that's the same list on the left-hand side there. And these are the functions that I've added, so you can see what it is about those control mechanisms that they have in common. And they are trees and wild habitat, sustainable agriculture, and some cases, water bodies, including wetlands, vegetation, biodiversity, all those things. All of them are what we might call nature. Now, Brian Moss in uh, 2016, he's featured a couple of times in this presentation, actually. He calculated that if, as long as we stopped cutting down rainforests and um, draining wetlands, and wetland loss is actually twice the rate of rainforest loss. Um, we could convert about a third of the total anthrone, that's the human controlled landscapes, farming mostly, uh, forestry as well. If we converted one third of the total anthrone into natural biomes, in other words, we, we allowed it to convert to its natural state, it would sequester 3.4 gigatons of carbon per year. So we're talking about um, absorbing carbon that's in the atmosphere. That's one way to do it. One third of the total anthrone converted to pristine equivalent ecosystems. So we need to, and that is equivalent to about um, doubling the existing remaining natural biomes. 
So the, the, we've got the global land area at the top there and the natural biomes are about a quarter of that. So we need to make them about half and one third of the total anthro need. And that would solve it provided we stopped destroying them at the same rate. So a plea, stop buying things that are funding destruction of the rainforests, particularly the rainforests or other natural things like the, like the wetlands in Kalimantan, which are being drained for palm oil. Um, or palm oil's in everything you can look at on the shelf, but you can get rid of it. And not just palm oil, soya as well. So stop eating, soya is the thing that feeds the beef. So my local supermarket in Morrison says we only produce British meat, um, but, their, but their meat is fed on palm oil and soy from rainforests. And that's one of the main things. So people blame governments for not taking advantage. They blame, they blame Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil for allowing um, development of the rainforest. The reason they want to develop it is because we here in Chester and everywhere else buy these products and so we're funding it. So that's my plea. Try and don't think about what you're buying. The real issue is global economics. They're not compatible with conserving a, a biosphere that is, is um, able to maintain the system um, into this homeostasis that we need and to stay within the planetary boundaries. It is, however many conventions we have, however many reserves we have and CITES lists and targets, they're not match, no match really for the economy that's growing all the time. So we need to spend less, that's what we need to do. So just a few slides about um, where I've come from. The Centre for Alternative Technology was set up in 1973, and that was a time when quite a few books came out. So there's the breakdown of nations there in 1957, um, which was a forerunner of Small is Beautiful. Silent Spring, 1962, Limits to Growth, 1972, Blueprint for Survival, 72, and Small is Beautiful, um, 73. They made people sit up and think, particularly Silent Spring, Limits to Growth, Blueprints for Survival, and Small is Beautiful. The breakdown of nations was you know, shuffled a few academic papers, but in fact, it was right on the money. That changed society. And um, a chap who was quite wealthy, Gerard Morgan Grenville, who was sort of a son of a, an aristocrat, um, he decided to set up a, a place to demonstrate where alternatives could be, could be um, shown and proven. So it was a test centre. Um, it opened to the public because we couldn't stop the public turning up. I say we, I wasn't there in that time. Um, but so it had these invented these solar panels made out of radiators and clip fins and things. So there were no commercial um, manufacturers of this sort of thing. This is an old Cretan windmill made of sail, generated electricity, fitting in water turbine there. Looks a bit like that American flag thing, I always think. Um, some of these people are still associated with with cat actually some of them moved on so today we're we've moved so so now everybody you know one in ten people has got a solar panel on their roof and so we've moved into education nowadays so we've built this sustainable building with a huge round earth wall you can see detail of it on the bottom left and we have a lot of students we've had, had thousands of students actually and we've produced graduates in these programs for MSCs, um, sustainability and adaptation to climate, environmental change, behavior change, energy provision, green building, ecology, uh, food and natural resources. And we also have a, an MRC in sustainable architecture, uh, which is a part two degree. So we're producing these people who are going out there changing the world. And it's very nice to see, you know, for example, Scottish electric producing this new plan for sustainability led by one of our graduates. So you might have heard of it. There's the references that I've used for this talk and there's some links to where I've come from if you want to. So thank you very much. And I think Sue's going to manage questions now. <laughs>